Sheik of Mars by Ben Wheeler. Read by Ben Wheeler. That's me. Prologue. I, who am the slave who copied down the Sheik of Mars' speeches at the gold, flying golden palace of the Emir of Saturn, have taken great pains to faithfully record every syllable as the great and noble lord said them. As he gestured, pace, and narrated with such emotion as cannot ever be transcribed, we saw true tears in his eyes at the deaths of his friends. We heard the note of triumph he must have had as a young warrior enacting his fearful vengeance. The manly voice quavered at the description of his bride being torn from him on his wedding night, and we became misty-eyed in sympathy. His weathered hands gripped at his legendary nanotech sword at his side, and made motions as if he was a young man again, fighting his foes once more. I, who am but a slave in the libraries of Saturn, the greatest library in all nine worlds and countless asteroids, have done my utmost to do perfect justice and honor to the great man's tale. Let this come before all lovers of virtue, justice, and fortitude, and reinforce their souls to do deeds no less than those I have preserved for all mankind, for all time. Chapter 1. The Dandy Prince This is the story that the Sheik of Mars, Harun Rashid, told on the night of his daughter's wedding to Jasper Silver, notorious privateer. He had made the multi-million mile journey to the emir of Kronos, who ruled Saturn, to celebrate, and as at all his children's weddings, he told this story. Noble emir, my cousin and friend, please accommodate and forgive my wordiness. This story is not short, but it needs to be told because I am an old man. If my story is forgotten, it will not be because I failed to tell it. At the beginning, I was a young man, barely bearded, and only a man under the law and not at heart. Indeed, I was boyish. In stature, I was a man. Clean-limbed and tall, I had flashing eyes, full of my fury, and with a sword I had few rivals. For poetry and storytelling, I was peerless among my family and their servants. For fashion, I dressed a little bit dandily, but made sure to attempt the military bearing that princes of Mars find fashionable. Our family had risen to one of the richest families from the poorest, due to the wisdom and cunning of my grandfather, Munim Rashid, who had been gifted by God with all such gifts as those who make money need. We then joined the ranks of the nobility through my father, Merrick Rashid, who did great deeds from the Sheik of Mars in times past, and even saved his very life in the war against the Caliph of the North Pole. We had traveled from our lands in barren southern plains of Mars to the regions closer to Olympus Mons, then capital of Mars, where the Sheik of Mars held court, southeast of the largest volcano of the solar system, in Hestia, we set our family. Through his dealings with nobles all around him, he became the governor of the province. I sat at meat with my dearest friend Ibrahim and my grandfather, both people I held closer to my heart than my own lifeblood and soul. Ibrahim was a free man, though born a slave and bought to be my boon companion. They succeeded in that aim. I was able to free him and his family, but such was his loyalty to me that he stayed, and was, rumor had it, to be arranged to marry a cousin of mine. His family would be raised even as mine had, from obscurity to what we may call happiness. He, being of a more warlike mind than I, was a captain of our family's guard. His face held a naturally wolfen cast, with a sardonic smile and sharp eyes. I never knew him to be malicious to me. 
At this lunch wherein servants had arraigned all the good things my family ate, and cool water with ice, which was a luxury, besides the fruits and sweet meats which were arrayed liberally, anything we did not eat was given to the servants, and then the poor. A slave in our house ate better than any free man. I was being petulant. I had a great burden on my mind, and my heart. I had seen the most delicate flower in all of Mars, and all the solar system. Zira al Zuwar, yes, even she who I named my last daughter after. I was with Ibrahim in the market. We were purchasing such goods as were necessary for the security of our house. When I turned aside, exhausted by the labors, sitting on the side of a fountain which spewed a hologram of water rather than the real thing, I saw her. She stood in the midst of many servants and a eunuch with a great sword and diverse sidearms for her protection. She was in the middle of giving alms to the poor. Her eyes were gentle and wise, with perfect grooming of the eyebrows. She wore the traditional head dresses and co body coverings of our people. Many keep it pure black out of devotion to a religion that was dying even then. She had, with wondrously skilled fingers, decorated her own with the most delicate designs. Flowers bloomed and geodesic patterns mesmerized my eyes. Her chin was pointed and her cheekbones high, her nose so perfectly straight that I could test a ruler by it, and it flared to perfectly proportioned nostrils. She had a lighter skin tone than mine, and she was made fairer from the flush of red that colored her cheeks as gently as any makeup. I could tell her figure was not like some who use that covering to hide ugliness of body and soul. Her feet which would peek out with a dainty step, were delicate and perfectly shod in wondrously embroidered green sandals. I turned to an old man, who was likewise sitting at the holographic fountain, and asked about the wondrous girl in front of me, if he knew her. Ah, young prince, that is Zira al -Zuar. I motioned for him to go on, praising the old man for his knowledge. She is the daughter of Sheik al Zuar, who rules the province below this one. He keeps this house for his daughters, as he wishes them to be, of all things, educated. He wants them to have culture and skills beyond what is expected of all fair members of our race. She herself decorated her clothes and the clothes of her maidservant. I motioned for, to the old man to continue. She is generous to the poor, and her father bemoans that her charity is sending him to the poorhouse. Allah be praised. But strange enough, she is an infidel, a Christian. She must break her father's heart. At this my heart soared. My family has been Christian for generations, and a match to such a girl. I stood to make some introductions of myself, or, catching myself, I thought to send the old man as a proxy, as he may have an in with the family. He arrested me by tugging my sleeve. Hold, O oh prince, and forgive my impertinence, but do not approach her or ask your servant to do so. She is guarded by a fierce and swarthy eunuch. You see him with the sword. The eunuch turned to us as if he had heard the old man. He gave me a stare with pupils as black as night and eyeballs as white as lightning. I could not meet his eyes. Such were the intensity. I quailed, but knowing that this feeling was unmanly and a pox on my own heart, I rallied and went forward, despite the murderous rage that flowed from those eyes towards me. I was an inch from touching the throng that had come to receive what alms and food she was giving out when she turned to the eunuch and motioned. He boomed out in a 
great basso voice that shook me. Make way! The lady passes! Move, dogs! She motioned and whispered into his ear. If you would be so kind. After this, the throng dispersed, but I could not move forward for the press, like a salmon swimming against the current. I despaired of reaching her, but Zira turned and met my eye to eye. Her eyes widened. I made a gesture of genteel greeting. Then she cast aside her eyes downward. She hurried on away from me. The eunuch smote me with another stare, and I found myself rooted in one spot. By the time I had recovered my senses, they were too far away to pursue with any dignity. Abraham stood next to me and laughed. What a beauty, but such a fierce guard dog. Even I was intimidated, and I didn't endure the full focus. We left, but Zira weighed on my mind like a millstone. I found that I had fallen in love with her. My eyes lost their shine. The fineries we ate were tasteless. The clever words of my friend Ibrahim were not amusing. The jewels of wisdom that flowed from my grandfather's tongue were as common rusted stones. I could not lift my hands to my lips to eat of the things set before me. I would only think of Zira and how to get her for myself. I would not add her to some harem, like the Sheik of Mars, who would take women from their homes and use them, then enslave them. She would be my wife and the mother of my children, or I would die. I was green with this sickness." Eventually, at my grandfather's urging to keep my strength, I took a morsel of prepared pulse to my mouth with bread. I found it horrible and tossed it aside. This angered my grandfather for a moment, and I prepared to leave, or to do something equally dramatic like cast myself down on the couches we were reclining on. I stayed, and my grandfather asked me what had gotten a hold of me. Ibrahim, like a laughing wolf, said, Oh, my lord, has youth fled from you that you do not recognize love sickness? Truly, my overdramatic blood brother was smitten this day by Zira al Zuwar. My grandfather smacked him upside the head for his impudent tone. Ha! You dog and son of dogs! My age only means I know how to strike the foolhardy and the petulant. And he delivered me a blow, but gently, to see if I was faking anything. I groaned, Oh, my honored grandfather, if you had seen her beauty, we would be fighting over her now. She is my dawn and rising sun, my morning star. Tumultuous Venus in full glory would not match her in grace and subtlety. My grandfather rolled his eyes at me and made a chattering noise with his teeth. That my son would raise a fool as to fall in love with a pretty pair of eyes. I s- and I suppose she tempted you with a peek at her toes as well. He tugged at his scented beard. Bah! You overdramatic goat herder that I spent the best money to educate you with philosophers and tutors brought from sacred earth and lordly Jupiter. I brought myself to my knees before him. Oh, my grandfather, you know that I learned their lesson well. Shall I give it to you? Shall, sh- did not a poet not one hundred years ago say, The grain is precious for its sustenance, but the lily is praised for its beauty. I say to you that Zira is both lily and grain to me. Abraham enjoyed himself at my expense. And the poets say, two hundred years ago, fools and poets speak poetry to woo, and I have read your poetry. I turned on him in rebuke. Finish the couplet. But the lack of grace turns a lord to a peasant. Grandfather, I understand that the Alzuars are our neighbors in the provinces. 
go to them and ask her to marry me. We shall go together. Such an alliance must be fair to the eyes of Sheikh al-Zuwar. Grandfather was now nearly tugging his beard out by the roots, and had twisted it to knots. I feared he would fall into an apoplectic fit. Oh, that I sent you to be a soldier in the Sheikh of Mars, God's peace upon him, army, rather than turn you into a poet. Listen to this proverb. Three hundred years old. A father's Duty is not done if his son is a poet, musician, or a clown. We quailed in mock horror at his trump card against our poetry. He sat down red in the face, but getting paler. Zira al -Zuar. He became very thoughtful. The tugs at his beard became soothing. Yes, honored grandfather. I began to hope against hope. He took a drink of water and red wine mixed. I suppose it is time I start to look for a wife for you. You have just turned fifteen, as sacred earth counts it. Youth may be intolerable with and without love, but a good woman is a fountain of youth to lovers. I will go. First, I'll send messages to your father and see if he, that he agrees with me. I will look into this. But if I find her unworthy... No, I will trust your judgment. I knew I could not, but I still promised. God have mercy on me and praise him for not making me a liar. I thought to speak some poetic word, but my learning left me. Ibrahim clapped me on the shoulder and raised me up. I stood, and he dusted me off. For love, sickness, good food and wine. For friendship, good men like an orchard. Come, let us finish this repast. Let your grandfather and I take care of it, between his wisdom and cunning and my silver tongue and good looks. We shall surely capture her. I was heartened by this, and permitted myself to eat sweetmeats and regain strength. My grandfather told Ibrahim to disguise himself as a beggar, and took his leave. I finished my meal and took a book of poetry from the library, and finding that unsatisfactory, I called one of our fencing instructors and took a lesson in swordsmanship to burn my excess energy. I found this too unsatisfying as well, and instead went up to a cool patio on our mansion to watch for my grandfather and friend. The visas of Mars reach far. My heart was calmed by the dimness of the sun. By the time the two came back, my brow was cooled by the breeze, which was coming even as my hot breath sighed for Zira. I could see twin sparks of light as the moons Phobos and Deimos came in from another angle from the sun, moving so fast as to see the orbits with the naked eye, though I would not dwell on them. The stars themselves were recognized by sight but different from anything on holy earth. Can you imagine seeing a sky that some part of you will never recognize? I waxed philosophical until I heard the gates open and the, heard the voices of my grandfather and friend. I forgot all philosophy and cast myself down the stairs to speak with them in all haste. They met me grimly and taunted me with a long-winded story before giving me the sweet release, relief of the answer I desired. Chapter 2. Zira's Household Ibrahim and my grandfather left through a servant's gate. They dressed as beggars in rags and rubbed dirt and waste on themselves. Never have two more pathetic panhandlers wandered around town. Ibrahim scouted the houses that the Alzuars rented out for their family and servants. Ibrahim took my grandfather aside and said, O oh, honorable lord, why are we skulking around in stinking disguises? 
we could as much walk up to the building and demand an entrance. You are the governor of the city, after all, and could make up any reasonable excuse to visit. Grandfather looked and found where the beggars gathered for daily distribution of food. Oh, Ibrahim, when will you learn patience? It is not enough that we visit. Does not a poet say, Lilies grow over a summer, but can die in a single harsh shower? He stooped and adopted the stance of abject poverty. He was like a beaten dog who knew the leash more than the feel of red grass of Mars. We must learn whether her virtue is true before making a decision. It's not like marrying you into the family, Ibrahim. Ibrahim bent himself double and limped beside my grandfather. He was like a soldier wounded in the back, a bent reed. Ah, an old man would that I had your cunning and begging and statecraft. Grandfather raised his hand to strike him, when the doors open and the servants welcomed beggars into the courtyard of the house to be fed. The, the facade of Zira's house betrayed nothing of the occupants, nor was any sign of wealth writ in the trimmings or window dressings. To be sure, any man wandering by would think it an uninteresting abode for any freedman. Once in the courtyard, it was evident that Sheikh al Zawar showered his daughter generously with every good desire of her heart. The courtyard abounded in flowering bushes and organized rows and columns. Each bush was so delicately shaped that my grandfather felt envious stirrings in his pious heart. The fragrance was peerless and more delicate than smoke, though the smell of the beggars and the impoverished threatened to overwhelm it, were it not for four orange trees, one at each corner, that assisted their low-lying brethren in their efforts, so that the whole effect was magnified. A fountain dominated the center and expelled clear water. This fell into cunningly wrought bells that produced music beautifully. The stonework was finely decorated, with depictions of grapes and doves. All around it were caryatids, and fetishes of cupids, angels, and other good things that blessed the soul. Each beggar gladly received a bowl of rich stew, savory to the nose, and a fine loaf of bread, as well as water. Then each was directed to a bench where he sat to eat. A priest who had some skill in medicine went to each one, checking his salves and providing spiritual healing as well. He was a man of great age, stooped and a bit fat, but learned eyes shone underneath a wise brow. A golden cross hung from a chain from his neck, and it fell below his thick neck. Grandfather and Ibrahim passed their food to less fortunate men and went about their business. Ibrahim saw a pair of guards watching the beggars and sidled up to them. With liberal offering of liquor, soon the men were speaking to the virtue of their charge. He could have saved the expenditure of the liquor. They did not need any encouragement. Zira was beloved of every member of the household. One guard was happy to tell the beggar Ibrahim how she had given much medicine to his mother when she had fallen deathly ill. They thought nothing of retelling tale after tale of her kindness and grace. My grandfather fared much the same. His target was a washerwoman who was doing a good deed by washing dirty linens for the beggars. He quoted some poetry to her, flattering her, and she was happy to speak with him. Such an educated gentleman for a beggar. He made up some sorry to her of an ungrateful and foolish grandchild and misfortune during some recent war. The washerwoman was a gossip and shed such secrets to the kindly old man as he wanted to know. Surely the Lady Zira al Zuwar was the most generous and kindest lady on earth or Mars. Though Master al Zuwar is a pious man and a Mohammedan, and she is a Christian, he can deny his daughter nothing. It is on his expense you that you so feasted, friend. Oh, my friend, if you had seen the lady as I have, on her knees praying ever for the soul of her father and her sisters. Her mother died in her youth, but was a Christian as her daughter is. 
She has also of late sighed as she looked out to the courtyard or into her embroidery. Surely she is enamored of some prince of the Martians, not the Sheik of Mars. May he rib forever. Son, but surely some noble youth. She said, Baba, for I have raised her as a mother. Oh, Baba, have you ever been in love? This went on for a very long while. Eventually, both Ibrahim and my grandfather were satisfied that Zira was as virtuous as I had claimed in my youthful zeal. A poet says, The fair flowers of the nightshade are deadly. Just so, women are known by their virtue. You can imagine my relief when my friend and grandfather came back to me, and laughing, told me that he would go to Sheikh al Zawar and see if anything could be arranged. What shall I say for the rest of it? Sheikh al Zawar was overjoyed that someone of our family's honor had become interested in his daughter. I and my grandfather, with some of the household guard, sumptuous gifts and regalia required for such a meeting, met him at his house. My grandfather and he, after taking snuff and meat together and huffing on a great golden hookah, eat hookah, easily agreed to the pairing to my joy. Indeed, he had despaired that any of the Christian princes of Mars would match his daughter or put a serious request for alliance. The son of the Sheik of Mars had made many advances on her to have her for a bride. The Sheik al Zawar was not a stupid man, and knew that his daughter would not be a wife, but rather a member of his harem. The Sheik believed that the Hori, the harem members, were no better than whores, especially the many in the Seraglio of the Sheik of Mars. He couldn't bear to think of Zira in the clutches of the Sheik or of his son. Despite the newness of our family, he considered our match very fair. All right. If you liked what you heard, uh, I will have a link down below in the doobly-doo. Uh, the printed version is quite cheap, as is the Kindle version, and I really hope you enjoy it. I'll be reading out all the chapters um, until they're over. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you tune in the next time. Goodbye. <laughs>